The few lines of code we wrote previously were very helpful in showing us how to get data in files with some safety. But we only wrote to the file. We didn't read anything. Write-only files are not exactly useful. So let's fix this by adding some read calls and see what happens. This should be straightforward. We use the write call to well write, so we can use read to read. Indeed, if we look at the methods on file, read is right there. It expects a byte array to store whatever bytes it read, just like write expected a byte array that would contain the data to write. So, the calls are pretty similar, and we can just go ahead and add the buffer to read into and pass it to the file.read call. Before we get there, we'll refactor our code a bit to keep it tidy. First, I'll make the string we wrote previously into a constant and change it to something more interesting and completely random. Then, we need to change how we open the file. Before, we just created the file and that automatically opened it for writing, which was good enough. But, this also meant that our code would fail if we tried to read from it or if it already existed. I invite you to try and read from a file that you open without the read flag and see what errors you get. To fix that, we'll use open options, which is a convenience struct that allows us to pass whatever options we want for opening the file. Today, we'll ask to create the file if it doesn't exist and open it for both read and write. Now that we wrote the file, we finally get to read it back. So first, will allocate an array to read the data into. We'll make it as big as the string that we wrote. We will initialize the array with some value, say 42, because it's what Rust expects us to do as responsible coders. Note that string len returns the number of bytes in the string, not the number of characters. However, it doesn't make a difference in our case since we only use the ASCII subset of characters and they all take one byte. If you didn't get that last sentence, don't worry. Character encodings, Unicode and UTF-8 are topics to be avoided unless forced otherwise, and they are definitely not necessary for what we're doing. The thing to remember is that for our purposes, characters take a single byte. Moving on, we'll finally read the contents of the file in our array. We'll also get the result of read, which tells us how many bytes the call actually read. This is important, because the read call may not actually fill the array we pass to it. This may happen, for example, if the file is smaller than the byte array we passed to hold the result. So it's good practice to check the number of bytes read and compare it with what we actually expected. Finally, we'll transform the bytes to a string so we can print it out. That should do it. Let's run this code and see what we get. Well, that didn't work as expected. We read zero bytes and the array has been left filled with asterisks. Here's a tip. On Linux, you can use man ASCII on a console and you will get a table of the ASCII encoding. Here, you can see that 42 is the code for asterisk. Since we loaded the array with the ASCII code for that, and nothing was read from the file to override those values, that's what we got. Going back to our code, if we open our file in an editor, we see the contents are correct. Yet, when we read from it, we got zero bytes. What is up with that? Let's go to the readman page to see if we missed something. The second paragraph seems relevant. It says that on files supporting seeking, the read operation commences at the file offset, and the file offset is incremented by the bytes read. If the file offset is at or past the end of file, no bytes are read and read returns zero. That certainly seems to fit what we see. But what is this file offset? Let's look at write. 
Well, how about that? It also says that for seekable files, like regular files, writing takes place at the file offset and the offset is incremented by the number of bytes actually written. So it seems like there is a file offset that the file somehow keeps, which is incremented whenever we read and write. And reads and writes happen at the offset. Okay, so it's like an index in the file pointing to where the next operation will happen. There are two more pieces that we need to clarify here. One is that write seems to be writing at the beginning of the file just fine. So we should expect that when a file is first opened, the offset is guaranteed to be zero. And indeed, if we read the man page for open, we see that open sets the file offset to the beginning of the file. So that checks out. The other is, how can we control the offset from Rust and even more basic, is our file even seekable? Let's take a look at the docs for file. Maybe there is something there. The file implements the seek trait, which seems to fit what the read and write calls we're talking about. Seek gives us methods to set the offset wherever we want, including this method called rewind, which sets the file offset at the start of the file. Nice. Just to clarify what is going on here, let me draw this out. Let's represent our file by a series of boxes, each of which holds a single character. We will also keep track of the file offset as a pointer to the file contents. We start with an empty file that we just opened, so the offset points at the start. When we write some data, for every byte we add, the file pointer moves to point to the next position. So, if we add a 4-byte string, like data, it will end up looking like this. When we try to read from it, without rewinding, the offset points at the end of the file, so the read call will not return anything. Rewind is needed to set the file offset to the start, and now we can read our four characters. With that out of the way, Let's try to rewind the file before reading. Straightforward change, just add a rewind call, doesn't need any arguments, only handling of the possible error. Run it, and yes, this seems to do it. So there, it took us three videos, but now we know how to write and read a file. Obviously, you can use these basic methods to open and read from any offset in any file which is an exercise you can do if you want to get more familiar with these methods. However, we have used open, read, write, and rewind so far. All these are system calls, which means they are requests from user programs to the operating system kernel. System calls are necessary when a user program needs to interact with the outside world, the hard disk in this case. But they also have some cost. A generally better way to do the kind of I.O. we have done so far is to use some kind of buffering. Roughly speaking, buffered I.O. means we ask the operating system to fetch a large chunk of data from disk, copy it to memory, and then we can access it at our convenience without asking the kernel to fetch it byte by byte. Same goes for writing. We write to a piece of memory, and at some point, we hand off large chunks to the operating system to write. Every programming language has its own way of doing buffered I.O. In C, you would use the stream I.O. functions, like fopen, fread, and fwrite. In Rust, we can use the buffreader, buffwriter structs, which, in addition to buffering, provide some additional functionality, like easier string conversions for, from bytes. For example, you can read a line of text directly without going through the byte array like we did earlier. Just to show you how to use it, in the code we wrote previously, we could instead create a buff reader and pass it a string reference directly instead of a byte array. 
and it works exactly the same. In the next video, we'll go on a slight tangent, see system calls in a bit more detail, and understand how buffered and unbuffered I.O. differ. After that, we'll resume our code writing and get into more interesting I.O. functionality by writing a real application that we can interact with. Thank you for watching.